Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, this is being presented by the Game Center with the support of SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And today's webinar is Coming Home to Work, Ways to, to, to Support Employment After Incarceration. Our three presenters are Kevin Garrett, Ray Woodruff, and Sharina Richard. And I will introduce them in a later slide. Uh, but first, uh, I am Dr. Melissa Stein, a Senior Research Associate with Policy Research Associates and the lead for communications at SAMHSA's Game Center. And before we begin, I have just a few housekeeping remarks. First, the views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation and discussion do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And throughout the presentations, if you have any questions for the presenters or in regards to technology, please type those questions into the Q&A pod at the right of your screen, and we will address as many of your questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. We will also be conducting a couple of polls and we really appreciate your participation in those. When you see the poll pop up, just select your response and enter it. The webinar is also being recorded and slides will be disseminated via the games or serve. And we will also notify you when the webinar recording is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. A certificate of attendance will be available for download at the end of the webinar. And please note, this is only for personal use. We are not able to issue CEU credits for this event. And finally, um, we were hoping to be able to present or provide some live captioning in the multimedia viewer. Uh, unfortunately, that service is not available today, and, and we apologize for not being able to provide that service. A quick look at our agenda. We have uh, opening remarks from John Berg, who uh, is at SAMHSA. And then we will have three presentations from Kevin Garrett, Ray Woodruff, and Sharina Richard uh, regarding employment. And we will close with some time for a question and answer. So we will go over as many questions that you all enter in the Q&A pod as, as, as time permits. But first, I would like to turn things over to John Berg, who is a senior public health, I'm sorry, he is a senior public health advisor for the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, and he has some opening remarks. John? Thank you, Dr. Stein. Um, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Coming Home to Work, Ways to Support Employment After Incarceration. We appreciate you taking time today to participate in this informative webinar. SAMHSA is very pleased to provide a webinar on the importance of employment for those returning to the community from incarceration. Employment for individuals re-entering the community after incarceration is a critical factor in providing stability and reducing the likelihood of further criminal justice involvement, especially for individuals with mental and substance use disorders. Employment can play an important role in recovery, not only providing income, but it offers a structured activity with a sense of purpose and accomplishment. Also, employment promotes membership in the community and social inclusion. Our presenters will provide three perspectives on employment as a necessary component of successful transition back to the community. Information about employment programming in a correctional setting will be covered, as well as recommendations for starting and running a community-based reentry employment program. They will also provide insight based on lived experience regarding specific barriers to finding and maintaining employment during reentry, as well as effective approaches to overcoming these barriers. We're very pleased to have three great presenters today, Kevin Garrett, Way Woodruff, and Sharina Richard. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and experience today with us and for your assistance developing this webinar. I would also like to thank the Gain Center and their staff for their work in developing and facilitating today's webinar. And with that, I turn it back to Dr. Stein. Thank you, John. And you all may have seen a poll pop up. We really appreciate your involvement if you just select 
your uh, responses and hit submit. And meanwhile, I will pre introduce today's presenters. First, we have Kevin Garrett, who is a peer policy fellow at Texas Jail Project, which is uh, his work is supported by the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health in Texas. And he brings a wealth of expertise in mental health issues and improving conditions and treatment for people in jails. With that, he has spearheaded six bills to help transform the state of Texas's jails into safer and healthier facilities. He serves as vice chair of the State Bar of Texas's Disability Issues Committee and as chair of the State Bar's Mental Health Subcommittee. And he brings lived experience of incarceration in both county jails and in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Prison System. Next slide. Ray Woodruff is the Assistant Administrator for the Division of Management Services of Wisconsin Department of Corrections. And he oversees analytical and operational services for all policies, programs, and service delivery initiatives. He recently managed several local and statewide initiatives to reduce recidivism and improve employment outcomes of individuals returning to the community from incarceration. Next slide. And Sharina Richard is the program director of the LifeWorks program at the Center for Community Transitions in Charlotte, North Carolina. And she brings expertise in human services and criminal justice fields. Previously, she served as case manager, intervention specialist, program trainer, and quality assurance coach, bringing expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy, alternatives to incarceration, prison rape elimination act, compliance ethics, motivational interviewing, and substance abuse counseling. And so as far as the poll, uh, thank you so much for participating. It looks like many of you are joining us from urban locations followed by rural locations and suburban. And it, it looks like many of you are calling or joining the presentation from community-based service providers, probation and parole, uh, corrections. And those are, uh, we, we hope you all are calling in from um, your respective reentry programs or hoping to create those. So thank you so much for joining us today. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Garrett to kick off our presentation. Kevin? Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to SAMHSA and the Gang Center and Policy Research Associates for allowing me this opportunity to uh, share, share some of my experience uh, with having navigated through um, this process. So first up, I'd, I'd just like to preface everything by saying that uh, this is my story, although they are useful employment strategies, I've seen them work, they work in my life. Uh, I've worked with men that I've mentored where it works, but, but this is my story and this is my experience, my lived experience through all of this. And so I just want everyone to keep that in mind. These are not things that I learned in a book or in a classroom or anything like that. This is what I actually went through, lived through. Um, also, uh, let me just start by saying that 14 years ago, um, I was sitting in a homeless shelter in Fort Worth, Texas, with 11 years left on parole, uh, multiple felonies on my record, I was unemployed, and I had a big time addiction problem. And now today, uh, I sit here a, uh, a law school graduate, having just taken the Texas bar, and I'm awaiting bar results. And so, you know, I say that just to to let everyone know that, hey, good things can happen. Good things can happen if we all work together on this process. So the first thing that I'd, I'd like to kick everything off with is, is to talk about the three main areas that I want to discuss today. Uh, I think they're all very important. I, obviously, employment, coming home from an incarceration setting and, and finding gainful employment is important. But uh, we've also got the recovery and, and health component that I think is important that needs to be addressed. And certainly in my own personal experience, that proved to be true. Uh, and then also uh, looking at, you know, policies, whatever, whatever state or jurisdiction you might be in, looking at whatever policies that might be in place that could either facilitate you know, a smoother transition back into the community or could possibly 
proposed barriers. So first up, um, and I always like to say, and it, it took me six years from 2001 to 2007 to find this out the hard way, but the, the first thing that I had to learn, and it was a hard lesson to learn, was, was that I had to un address the underlying condition that led me into incarceration in the first place. For me personally, that was my, my mental health condition and my substance abuse. You know, I mentioned earlier that I, I had that addiction on my back. And if you think about it in terms of, of uh, employment seeking and, and trying to figure out what's the best way to, to go about getting employment for someone that has a record, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not going to do a whole lot of good to get a good job, you know, and to have things starting to work out but still have that looming addiction or mental health issue or, or whatever the case might be, whatever led a person into prison in the first place to still be there because eventually they're going to lose the job, right? So I, I always look at that as like the, the most important thing nowadays. I spent six years from 2001 to 2007 thinking that if I got housing, everything would be all right. Thinking that if I got employment, everything would be all right. But I never in that time really took a long, hard look at my underlying condition, which was my addiction that that really led to everything. So everything is, is really all interrelated. Uh, all of those uh, financial responsibility, employment, employment opportunities, housing, all of that is, is all interrelated. And I think the first thing that, that needs to be addressed at any time is looking at what possible uh, barriers might be out there that's preventing me from from getting um, successful employment, something that, that will provide me the best opportunity to not return back to the incarceration setting. So um, in the in the employment arena, you know, after for me, after having addressed my my addiction first and and really approaching that as it was a job, you know, everything else really began to, it just kind of like fell into place for me. You know, initially when I, when I got out in 2001, I, I did not aspire to be a lawyer. I didn't. I, I needed a job and specifically I needed a job to keep my parole officer off of my back. Right. But I also needed a job to, to, to feed myself and to clothe myself and to, you know, to get shelter. And it, it, at first, it didn't make sense to me, but I, I started out by taking whatever work that I could get. And I, I would strongly suggest to anyone that's, that's um, initially leaving an incarceration setting to not be too picky about what work you get, because, I mean, it, it all works together. These are the initial steps. I mean, if if I went to work as a dishwasher. My first job in 2001 when I got out was a dishwasher. And, you know, everything just, just worked together off of that. You know, I, I, I took jobs part-time, you know, when necessary. I took day labor jobs. And I, I looked at opportunities that were in my community, which at the time, it, there weren't a lot, but I looked at um, opportunities where employers would be second chance friendly. And I've embedded a little link here, and you can check that out later on when the, the uh, slides are released. But, you know, all of this was the beginning part of my employment and, and seeking employment. You know, I, I had to approach my job search and then later on my resume building skills as though it were a job. And that's what I would do. I would tell myself every day when I rode that, that city bus and I, you know, back at this time, they, we didn't have online applications and stuff like that. I mean, you actually had to do the footwork, the actual literal footwork, and go place to place and get doors slammed in your face and things like this. But I approached it as it was a job. You know, initially, yes, it was frustrating. It was very frustrating to have people tell me that, hey, you seem like a, a nice fella and everything, and we'd like to, but uh, we don't hire felons. You know, and I had to adjust my attitude uh, to something that would be a little bit more conducive uh, to my my 
my initial option, uh, obstacle, and that was getting a job, getting my foot in the door. And the way that I changed my attitude is, is I looked at it like, you know what? There are a lot of employers that are saying no, but while they're saying no, I'm developing a really, really good uh, interview skill set. You know, I'm I'm finding out, you know, what I'm saying wrong, how to dress, you know, how to get there early. You know, all of these things, all of these things are very, very important. And here at the bottom of this slide, I, I've left in a little link there. I think it's a, a really, really great thing. I wish they had this 19 years ago when I started this journey, but uh, the Texas Department of Criminal Direct Corrections, um, Criminal Justice, excuse me, they have developed a website that is user friendly, not only for uh, individuals leaving jails and prisons, but it's also for, for uh, potential employers. Those employers out there who are willing to give someone a second chance. And on that website, uh, potential employers can go there and say, hey, yes, I'll, I'll hire you know, a guy as long as they can, you know, as long as they have experience in plumbing, as long as they will be there, you know, on time with a good attitude. So it's a really, really great way to, to get started in that employment deal. Now for, for me, and not everybody, not everybody is, is, is gonna wanna be, you know, uh, in, in the skilled labor uh, sector. You know, some people like, like myself, would would prefer to go back to school. For me, once I once I started to address my my addiction and everything, I initially went back to undergrad. Not again, not because I wanted to become a lawyer, but because it, it, it for personal reasons. It made me feel good. It made me feel worthwhile. And it and and it takes a lot to shake you know a lot of those negative feelings and and attitudes and everything that one you know gets while in the incarceration setting. So education was a really, really great way to go. I don't suggest it for everyone, but if it's if it's something you're interested in, I would definitely say go for it. I mean, it, it's a great opportunity to get yourself on your feet, to gain a sense of self-worth, to get confidence, and, and all of that works hand in hand with, with everything else. Uh, the next slide I have up here, meaningful activities. This was very important to me. Early on, as I started my uh, journey in in the previous slides, when I said first thing first, and I addressed my addiction, you know, one of the one of the first things that my first mentor said to me is, is Kevin, you've got to get out there and you've got to get busy doing something for somebody else. And I thought to myself, well, that's pretty crazy because my life sucks. First of all, don't I need to be working on me? And second of all, what do I have to contribute to them? And oh my God, I can't, I cannot believe how I, I so underestimated what he was trying to teach me at that time. And so I started volunteering at a, uh, at a community center that was uh, geared towards helping men re-enter back into the community. They, they had a uh, department in there that was, uh, that was for rehabilitation. And so I, I would go there and I approached that as it was a job. And, and you know what kind of came of that? experience is, is I, I started to learn a sense of responsibility and I started to to look at the bigger picture instead of being uh, so caught up in me 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 and and what I need to do what I need to do I started to learn that that it's a community effort and it, and it takes you know caring for my brothers and sisters out there you know to help me that's actually what helped me it helped me personally it helped me in my recovery and it certainly helped me in my uh, work goals and my career goals. You know, if I can be on time to a rehab center where, where you know, I'm not required to be there and I'm not paid to be there, but if I can be on time and I can show up and I can show up with a good attitude, with a spirit of helpfulness, then, I mean, it makes all the difference in the world. And I, I had no idea, but at the time, you know, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, when I started doing that, I was developing really, really good work skills at the same time. So I think meaningful activities and if volunteering is, is not your thing, I mean, there, there's all kinds of things you could do that would help you to develop really, really good uh, employment strategies and skills that would make you a really good employee. Because 
at the end of the day, most employers, and I know we have a lot of participants out there, and I know there's quite a few potential employers out there, I, I think that they would agree that at the end of the day, all of an employer wants to know is, is number one, will you be there on time? You know, what is your attendance? And number two, will you be there on time with a good attitude? You know, nobody wants to hire somebody that's going to come in with a negative attitude that's going to be a cancer to their organization or to their company, you know, and, drink, and bring the company down. And, and going back to that attendance component, you know, attendance is not just being physically present, but it's being actually engaged, be there on time and ready to do my work. You know, I, I had jobs before, I had a job in 2007 where, and we got paid a pretty good salary, but a lot of the employees spent time in the service area just talking and drinking and laughing and telling jokes. And I decided I didn't want to be like that. You know, I I I, I felt like I, I I owed my employer a, a huge sense of gratitude and the way that I could show my gratitude for them giving me an opportunity was to be really engaged while I'm there, really there, ready to work for them. And so on the policy side of things, um, and the state of Texas didn't really start to get on board with, with a lot of this until we realized probably a decade ago that, that building more prisons is not the answer. And eventually everyone's going to get out and they're going to come back to the community and they're going to need jobs, right? Um, you know, the first link that I, that I put up here in my slides is the Fair Chance Act. It, that's something that's going on, not just in Texas, but, but across the nation where, um, Employers are actually looking at some of the questions and things like that 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 might uh, discourage someone with a with a uh, with a felony on their record might discourage them from even applying. So they're they're taking some of the like of the questions on the application and stuff like that. Like, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And instead of being focused on that, they're looking at the qualifications, you know, and things like that. So. Uh, I, I really think that that's a really good thing. I think that we're really moving in the right direction, not just in Texas, but also as a country. But it, it's, you know, it, it. I think it takes a community effort. It takes all of us, right? I, I have yet to meet a person, and I certainly didn't have this experience personally, but I, I have yet to meet a person that upon leaving prison or jail, they thought, wow, I can't wait to go back. You know, it, it, it just doesn't happen like that. Most, I'd say 99% of the people that get out want to get out and they want to stay out. And I, I'm just grateful that, that legislatures, not just in Texas, but across the country, are starting to recognize that if they make things a little bit uh, easier for people to be able to, to seek employment and, and maintain employment, it makes it better for everyone. It really makes it better for everyone. And so uh, in conclusion here, again, I, I just like to say it, it really does. It takes a community effort to address all these employment barriers. I mean, this, this, uh, this big gap that we have, this big black hole that we have out there that, that, that hadn't been addressed for many, many years is just now starting to get addressed. I mean, it, it, it really makes sense that we all get on board with this, whether it's a potential employer, whether it's, it's a job seeker, whether it's someone like myself who has already gotten a job that wants to go back and help others. I mean, that's the way we tackle this thing. So in closing, uh, I, I just like to say something. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote a really good friend of mine. He's a, uh, a corporate real estate or retired corporate real estate executive. Uh, I met him like, 15 years ago or so, and he's really been instrumental in my turnaround in life. You know, he said something to me, and at the time, it, it was really strange, but he said, he said, Kevin, I don't have everything I want, but the difference is, today, I want everything I have. And that really, it, it, it was like he was speaking a foreign language to me initially, but over the course of time, I've, I've come to realize what he meant. What he meant is, is, I need to remain grateful. I need to be be grateful for what I have. I think far too many times we 
we tend to focus on what we don't have. I don't have clothes. I don't have a car. I don't, you know, I don't have any support. I don't have any help. What I think and what's definitely been helpful to me is that when I switch that around and I start focusing on what I do have and I start being grateful for what I do have, then possibilities open up and the world becomes a much better place. So thank you everyone. And uh, I look forward to answering any and all questions that pop up later on. And uh, at this time, I would like to turn it over to our next uh, panelist, Ray Woodruff. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, I'd also like to thank SAMHSA and uh, as well as Policy Research Associates for the opportunity to um, discuss some of what, well, what, some of what we've done here in the state of Wisconsin over the last several years, but some of the trends that um, are happening across the country with regard to looking at different ways to do business. And I think um, Kevin, you know, really set the stage perfectly here today. Um, to talk from, from a, certainly a lived perspective, but just um, from the perspective of folks who are um, intentional about their interest to, to reenter the workforce, to reenter society in meaningful ways, um, we, whether they've been incarcerated or not. And, um, and I think, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just thankful to be able to talk about some of what we've done here in the state of Wisconsin, as was mentioned at the beginning, uh, most of my career I've spent in working in correctional facilities um, with individuals who are incarcerated, who are coming out of incarceration. And for the last several years, that's been in the role of um, uh, overseeing various employment-related programs, uh, primarily throughout the state of Wisconsin. Now I'm in a, a, in a slightly different role, but I still um, have the opportunity to have a lot of influence over what we do with regard to policy and procedures in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, one of the things I guess that I, I like to talk about, and, and mostly what I'm going to speak of is, is from the perspective of policy development, program development, and strategies that folks can use to develop interventions um, for individuals who might be incarcerated or who have come out of incarceration in your communities. Uh, but, but I always like to sort of set the stage because I think it's a really important topic. Um, obviously, I work in this field for a reason, but I think it's an important topic to discuss because so many people are impacted by the criminal justice system, um, certainly in the state of Wisconsin, but, but, but throughout the country. You know, nationally, we know that over 6.6 .6 million adults are under some form of active correctional supervision. That's about one in 38 across the country. Um, you know, that's a, lot, that's, that's a lot of people impacted by our system. And so, um, I think, you know, I, to Kevin's point, I think, you know, we, we need to focus interventions that make it easier um, for people who want to better their lives. And, um, you know, in the state of Wisconsin, we have around 66,000 people under correctional supervision in the community. We have another, we're a little bit less than 22,000 people, persons in our care, um, meaning people who are incarcerated in our state facilities in the state of Wisconsin. And we have around 8,500 to you know, 9,500 people that um, are releasing back to the community every year from incarceration. And it's just important for me to, to sort of put that in perspective when we talk about different interventions that we um, have put in place. And, and again, I think this is not unique to the state of Wisconsin, right? It's, it's happening throughout the country that lots of people are um, coming back out to the community every single year. And, and the vast majority, to Kevin's point, you know, they, they want to be reintegrated into the community in a meaningful way. They want opportunities. Um, we just need to provide those opportunities sometimes um, in a little bit more meaningful and intentional way. And I just like to um, also look at sort of what is the age range of people that are coming out of incarceration. Um, I, I would guess this is similar elsewhere in the country, but we have a lot of people that come out of our system that are still in that 25 to 40 year uh, year old um, age range. So these these individuals are um, sort of potentially looking at a long career ahead of them, and and it's important for us to prepare for that um, and prepare them for that eventual career. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this right now, but um, I liked what Kevin said about you know the first step in really looking at 
getting people back to the point where they can um, get engaged in meaningful employment or opportunities outside of incarceration is to address the underlying conditions. I think that's the, that's the exact words that Kevin met, uh, said. And I, and I think it's true, you know, most, if, if there's people on the call or on the uh, webinar who are working with people who are coming out of incarceration, you know that you can get people jobs, right? You know you can get people um, a job, but, but we need to worry about, is this something that they can maintain? Um, to Kevin's point, are they going to show up on time? Are they going to show up with a good attitude? Are they going to show up the next day um, after they get the job? So we really need to address the underlying issues first. And I'm going to talk about some of what we're doing in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but what we do know with regards to employment and what the research has shown is that if we increase education, programming, and employment opportunities for people who are incarcerated or for, for people who are impacted by the justice system, ultimately we will see reduced recidivism, we'll see reduced corrections costs, and we'll see reduced unemployment. We know that people who get out of incarceration and who are working and, and particularly those who are, are earning higher wages are less likely to um, recidivate, which essentially means commit further criminal acts to come back to prison. Um, and also we'll see increased income tax and sales tax revenue. And, and finally, I'll just say what we do know with regard to research is that subsidized employment programs for people who have been recently released from prison as well as sort of wraparound services, um, meaning sort of the reach-in uh, services. You, you know, you, you're connecting to people who are currently incarcerated and that follow them into the community. We know that these have been shown to boost employment and earnings while reducing recidivism. So, you know, if we're able, if in your area you're able to identify some subsidized employment um, programming to connect people to, and, and especially if you're able to connect with the, the Department of Corrections in your area or even county jail systems in your area, if you're able to connect with them to do some reach-in programming that is connected to post-release programming, I think you'll see the biggest results um, and, and the best results for the, for the particular population that you might be working with. So again, you know, employment is one factor. Um, but it's not the only factor, right? We need to address the underlying issues that someone might be um, experiencing that may be led to them being incarcerated in the first place. And historically, and again, I, you know, I'm in Wisconsin now. I worked in the state of Ohio as well. I think historically corrections has, has um, thought that potentially they maybe have all the answers, right? We, we know how to get, um, uh, give people an education. We know how to deal with substance abuse issues. We know how to then get people jobs and then make sure they stay out of incarceration. But I, but I don't, you know, I, I don't think that that's the case. I think um, Corrections does a really good job at identifying those underlying issues, those underlying conditions that maybe um, led someone to incarceration in the first place. So maybe looking at cognitive behavioral components, um, maybe some of that substance abuse issues um, that Kevin mentioned. But we also need to be working with our partners who are maybe experts in workforce development or education or housing or transportation or whatever the case may be to really work together rather than in our own separate lanes. And I think for a long time, particularly with correction, with regard to corrections and workforce development, we worked on separate paths. We might have been working with the same client, but we certainly weren't working together. And so what we have tried to do in the state of Wisconsin over the last several years is integrate our services, meaning developing an integrated case plan for people who are coming out of incarceration that accounts for all of the um, risk and needs that an individual may have that um, are associated with potential criminal behavior as well as accounts for um, employment readiness, um, uh, the ability to maintain employment once they, once they obtain it. And, and we're really developing that integrated plan. Um, we, we've worked pretty hard to develop those relationships over the last, I would say, decade. 
Um, and, and in a couple slides, I'll talk about some of those relationships. But I, I, I think that's the only way forward. I think the only way forward is a true collaboration with um, partner agencies that are um, all invested in the success of, of clients. You know, I think people use collaboration a lot. Um, I, I don't love that term because I think people think, as, well, as long as we're on the same committee, then we're collaborating. No, I think collaboration means we're all invested and um, we're all willing to put for, forward resources to make, to make the success a reality. And um, one of the tools that we've used in the state of Wisconsin is this resource allocation and service matching tool. And again, I know that this PowerPoint slide is going to be sent out to all the participants after um, the call, I, I think maybe a few days. Um, and this will be there. This is taken from the Council of State Government Justice Center white paper that was um, created in 2013 called Integrated Reentry and Employment Strategies, which is focused exactly on what I'm talking about, reducing recidivism and increasing employment readiness for people who are impacted by the justice system. It essentially says that, that you know, everybody has own, their own individualized needs, but people can broadly fit into these four different program buckets when we're thinking about employment-related programming for a justice-involved population. Um, I think that this is a really helpful tool for people who are out there who are interested in working towards an integrated model. I think you can use this to really start to determine how do we, how do we fit people into programming based on their risk, their needs, their employment readiness, their, their resources, their skill sets that they have. Are we intentional about how we put people into programs or are we not? And I think what we have found in the state of Wisconsin with two separate projects in the Milwaukee area and the Madison area, that oftentimes programs are not intentional about how they move people into specific program tracks. And that can really hold back the individual participant sometimes. Um, if, if, if people come to your door as a community-based organization and everybody gets the same sort of service delivery model, um, you, you potentially could be making individuals worse off who, um, who maybe needed a light touch potentially and uh, maybe we're giving them intensive services, but they don't really need those intensive services. So it's, re it's really important to be intentional and, and prescriptive when you're looking at how to move people through different program components. Um, and, and, and just to give you an example of what this looks like in practice. So in the state of Wisconsin, what we did, um, we, we, we sort of did a deep dive into, the, into Milwaukee, the, the Milwaukee community and the Madison community to look at community-based provider networks and are they intentional about their, their programs. And again, what we found is, is is there are a lot of community-based resources out there, um, but they, in some cases, weren't working closely with Department of Corrections. Some cases, we weren't sharing information to really make those um, appropriate referrals. And so it's important that um, we develop this integrated model. And so a way that this looks in practice in the state of Wisconsin, we have these two different program models that I want to that I want to talk about. Um, these are both pre-release, meaning they're happening in our um, incarcerated setting, in our prison system now, but they're two very different types of program models. The first on the left is called Windows to Work. That's a program that we contract um, with the Workforce Development System in the state of Wisconsin to provide this program. It's a pre- and post-release program, so it's that reach-in component to the external component. component. It has employment readiness and cognitive behavioral interventions infused into the programming. So we do role plays, there's immediate feedback, there's elements of financial literacy and soft skills. There's also a subsidized employment component after release for, for people who are um, in, enrolled in that program. The target um, uh, sort of audience for the program are those who are deemed moderate to high risk on a validated risk and needs assessment tool. And um, sort of the last component is it, it's pretty intensive engagement with really coordinated, serv with coordinated services across 
um, agencies across jurisdictions to provide those wraparound service components. So participants in that program get connected to education, they get connected to um, housing, there, there's, there's housing dollars available for clients in that program. So the component, the, um, um, the target audience for that and, and, and who's best um, equipped to, to go into those programs are those individuals who are higher risk and less job ready. So if we look back on the other slide, those um, you see on the right hand side, higher risk, less job ready individuals. On the right side of the, the screen here, we see a different type of pre-release program. We have institution-based job centers in the state of Wisconsin. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like in a, in a minute, but it's a pre-release component only. It's not a post-release component, although folks can access job centers after their release. And it's focused only really on the employment attainment element, element. not necessarily the, the getting people ready for employment, uh, but more the employment attainment, so resume development, interview prep, job search, job coaching. It's available to all people of all risk levels, and it's pretty low intensity, and there's no incentives, and there's minimal structure, so that's more ideal for someone who is lower risk on a risk and needs assessment and more job ready. So th these are just two examples, and I just show them to show that, that as, as an agency, as um, program providers, it is incredibly important to be intentional about the program tracks that people fit into because you really want, you want, you really want individualized services as, as much as we can for people that are coming out of incarceration. Um, and and I, I spoke briefly. I just think, I just want to end, there's a couple slides here that I just want to end on and then I'm, I'll certainly answer questions as they come up. This, none of this, none of the work that we've, we've done over the past decade or more it's possible without partnerships with our partner agencies, and that's primarily been accomplished just through, you know, let, let, let's talk about, um, uh, you know, what, how can we get mutual benefit out of this? We're all serving the same people, but we've maybe been serving them differently. How can we all, you know, recognize some mutual benefit here to, this, to serving this population? And we've all put in actual dollars on the table. So, you know, that's where that collaboration really makes sense because everybody's putting in their resources to really make a difference. So we've developed relationships with all of the workforce development areas throughout the state of Wisconsin, the state labor agency, the, the Department of Workforce Development, um, the, the Wisconsin Workforce Development Association, the Wisconsin Technical College System. Again, all of these have been really intentional to say, you know, let's, let's bring everyone's expertise to the table to see how we can best serve um, our shared client base. And then I just wanted to show, show a picture of something that I'm really just really proud of, of what we've done in the state of Wisconsin. We developed these institution-based job centers. And, um, uh, you know, I, again, I don't know how many folks on the call have, have seen um, classrooms or buildings inside a correctional institution. I would just say, that at the Oak Hill Correctional Institution, there's no other space that looks like this in, in, in that facility, and that was intentional. We wanted this to look different. We wanted this to um, be a space that people could come to, and they could really think about being out in the community and looking for jobs. And something else that I'm just really excited about is everything that you see in that picture there was, was created and painted and done by people who are incarcerated. So, um, individuals who are at that facility had um, ownership over what what does this look like, um, and and I just I just I just thought that that was incredibly important when we were built, building the space. The 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 maybe one of the best parts about the institution-based job centers are that we are working with our partners at the Department of Workforce Development, and their staff are actually coming into the institution and working with clients who are incarcerated. So that it's not us, it's not the Department of Corrections, it's not another social worker or case manager um, or teacher, it's somebody from outside that's coming into the institution and, and really helping people um, prepare for release. So people who are incarcerated can look for real jobs that are posted by real employers, they're able to create resumes, they're able to apply for jobs, they're able to interview for jobs via Skype or phone interviews or people that can come in, and they're able to accept jobs all prior to release. 
So for me, this is really a culmination of, of a lot of work, you know, with, within our agency to get to the point where we, um, we, you know, this is a reality for us. We, we know that to prepare people for release in the, in the real world, which is out in the community, we need to do everything we can prior to release to get them prepared. Um, so, you know, I know my time's running up, so I just want to end it there. And again, thanks um, for the opportunity to discuss some of the initiatives in the state of Wisconsin. I'd be happy to answer any questions that might come up through the chat as we can get to them. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sharina. Thank you, Ray, and thank you, Kevin, and, and I would also like to thank SAMHSA for having me. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome. My name is Sharina Richard, and I work for the Center for Community Transitions located in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is my pleasure to be here with you all today so I can share with you the great reentry work that we're doing in North Carolina. We are a community-based program, and that's exactly what I'm going to talk to you about now. At the Center for Community Transitions, our slogan, tagline, and motto is building people, not prisons. I work with a passionate group of people, and together we join forces every day to empower the individuals that come into our program. We want to see them make the life changes that they say they want to make. We hold them accountable so that recidivism is a thing of their past. I know recidivism was, was spoken by both Kevin and Ray, um, and at the Center for Community Transitions, we are aware that there can be many barriers to achieving success after incarceration, and so that's why we're there. We focus on helping our clients break down as many as possible while they're with us. And then we also give them the tools to continue to break through barriers long after completion of our program. Building People Not Prisons is our true mission at the Center for Community Transition. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about exactly how we do the work at CCT, but first I would just like to provide you with a little bit of history. So the organization first came about in 1974, and it was called Ex-Cons Organization also known as ECHO. The goal was to help individuals returning to the Charlotte area after incarceration navigate reentry with support. They didn't stop there, though. In 1987, ECHO opened a 20-bed prison work release program for women completing state sentences. This was the first state contract for this, and that program continues to operate today as a 30-bed facility for women. In 2006, ECHO began an individual and classroom-style program which operated as an aftercare post-release program to help build life skills and to help connect individuals to community resources and agencies. It was officially named LifeWorks at that time to indicate that life does work. I am the current program director for the LifeWorks program today. In 2007, the board approved to change the name from Ex-Cons Organization to the Center for Community Transition. We are commonly known and respectfully referred to in the Charlotte Reentry community today as CCT. In 2016, the LifeWorks program moved to the Goodwill Opportunity Campus. This move was designed to position the program for a larger client outreach and as an opportunity to allow client access to more services in a one-stop shop sort of way. In May of 2020, due to COVID-19, the LifeWorks program launched an e-learning platform. This allowed us to continue to serve our clients throughout the pandemic and to engage with them through technology. Today, the LifeWorks program kicks off its services with a two-week employment readiness workshop. A little bit about the funding. CCT is funded through grants, annual fundraising events, individual and faith-based donations, corporate partnerships, contractual programs, and fee-for-service programs. Now to fun stuff, and this is actually the part about my presentation that gets me really excited, the LifeWorks program. So let me tell you about the LifeWorks program. We strive to provide individuals who are just as involved 
with the conditions, resources, and tools needed to reach their professional and personal goals. We offer support, empowerment, and skills training. Our support is indefinite and ongoing. We often tell clients that once a CCT client, always a CCT client, because we will always be here for them. We will never turn anyone away. I mentioned earlier that we do realize that there's barriers. And so we start this process by providing the conditions for clients to shift their thinking. If thinking shifts, then behaviors will shift and long-term successes can be reached. Again, we strongly believe that if thinking changes, behavior will change, performance will change, and overall lives will change. Not only the lives of our clients, but the lives of the people directly connected to them as well. I'm going to go over exactly um, how we do things at the LifeWorks program. We enter our clients into our program through a two-week employment readiness workshop, as I um, mentioned earlier. And we consider this workshop to be somewhat unique to other workshops because we start off with a branding class. Um, and as it's pictured here in my diagram, it says your brand lives here, which is in the brain, right? So we teach. We teach our clients that their brand lives in their brain, in their thinking. Clients often come to us broken, discouraged, saddened, and experiencing cognitive dissonance. How we see ourselves is how we believe others see us. So we give them the opportunity to analyze what small things, if any at all, they could possibly change on the outside to better represent their brand. We often notice that after the first day, they will come back having made some slight change in their appearance, maybe a haircut, shave, change the way that they're dressing. For us, this is the first evidence that some of the dissonance is beginning to shed, a little bit of getting off the fence. We then teach them how to market their brand on and off paper with hard skills like answering the conviction question on an application. The box has not been banned in the state of North Carolina, so they have to answer that question. Um, we go over resume building, how to market their prison work experience on an application and resume, how to make cold contacts to employers, uh, interviewing skills and interview practice. And lastly, we give them the opportunity to show up as that new brand every single day. At CCT, we largely focus on three things, getting a job, keeping a job, and achieving economic mobility. And like it's already been said um, by the two previous presenters, Kevin and Ray, um, sometimes clients can get a job, individuals that are just involved can get a job, but may have a hard time keeping a job. You can't keep the job, then you can't gain that, that full economic mobility. So for us, complete and employment readiness is just the beginning. Once our clients have the skills to get the job, we want to provide access to necessary required skills to keep the job, the interpersonal skills or the soft skills they're also known as. So simultaneously, while completing an accredited two-week soft skills training workshop, our clients are also attending a weekly employment networking event where they get to meet second chance employers, employers who know that they have a background. Job leads are also given to the clients on an ongoing basis, and they receive continued support from the entire team as they search for employment. We celebrate their successes with graduations and incentives. Goal setting. So client advisement. We realize that our clients come to us with some personal and professional goals that they want to achieve. Sometimes they don't really know how to put them into the right words. So we have client advisors um, in addition to our workshop. Each client is strategically matched to a client advisor. And this is someone that works with them one-on-one -on -one to help identify and achieve goals. This is done using a person-centered approach. And what I mean by that is our advisors don't tell anybody what to do. At LifeWorks, we direct them in making their own self-identified changes. We are their personal cheerleaders.
we try to make sure that we're targeting all of the barriers. So another third offer is seeking safety. We understand that being just as involved alone is a traumatic experience. So seek, the seeking safety model is offered for additional support to our clients. It's offered weekly by a trained professional to help provide individuals with a history of trauma and or substance abuse disorder an opportunity to learn some healthier coping methods in a safe environment. The beauty of seeking safety is it's present focused, so the clients will never be asked to revisit their trauma. And the two main focal points when using this model are emotional safety and the addition of healthy, healthy coping skills. Some different ways to do things um, when dealing with trauma. In September of 2018, CCT partnered with NC Fit, which is also known as North Carolina Formerly Incarcerated in Transition. Um, this partnership also includes Charlotte Community Health Clinic and I'm really excited about this partnership because this really helped close a huge gap. Um, this partnership was designed to offer formerly incarcerated individuals with either chronic disease, mental illness, or substance abuse disorder um, with appropriate health care services. And so to date, we have helped over 100 clients through this program receive medical care where otherwise they wouldn't have been able to. At CCC, we realize that we can't do it alone, and I think this was said already once today as well. Um, so we partner with other agencies to provide a variety of wraparound services. We have partners in the community who help with clothing, medication access, treatment services, housing, mental health care, haircuts and grooming services, food donations, and much more. Um, it truly takes a village, an entire community to do this great work. I'm not going to hold you too much longer because I do want to have time for questions, but I would like to talk about some outcomes. So in I would like to talk about success. We provide services to over 870 plus justice involved individuals in the Charlotte area. Of those who complete life work, 72% of those clients obtain employment. 86% of those clients are employed after six months and beyond and the recidivism rate is only 17%. Those are great numbers, but I say that to say, we see much more success than the numbers could ever show. We see confidence and self-esteem peak in a very short time span. We see people rebrand themselves, remarket themselves, and achieve personal success, and that is the most rewarding outcome of all. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you so much to our three presenters uh, for this wealth of information. This has been such an enlightening um, webinar for, for myself, um, and I hope it has been for everyone listening in today. We're going to take a few minutes for some questions, and we've had a few come in during the presentation, so we're just going to start with those. And if you have additional questions, then feel free to enter that into the Q&A box. <clears throat> Pardon me. Okay, so we had a few questions come in during uh, Kevin's portion of the presentation. So we'll start with some of those questions. And uh, so first, you know, Kevin, this just off the top of your head, um, someone was asking about any other books, video training, um, you know, materials that uh, that that folks can use to gain more knowledge, and, and I'm assuming more knowledge around um, this topic of, of employing people with justice involvement. Um, do you have any suggestions just off the top of your head that you feel comfortable sharing now? And if not, we can certainly share that information when we disseminate the slides later. Well, uh, 
to speak, I mean, that's a great question to speak off the top of my head. Uh, you know, I say, I said at the very beginning of my presentation that everything that I was presenting today was based on personal experience. And, and I am of the school. I mean, it, I mean, this is not to look for information in, in, in other areas is great. I mean, I, I always say what works for you, go for it. But for me, experience truly was the best teacher. And when I say experience, I, I, I must, uh, I must say that it doesn't necessarily have to be personal experience. You know, I, I, I have watched other, others who began their journey along the same time that I did and like some of the missteps and some of the mistakes that they made, you know, I paid attention to that. And I, I paid attention to, to people who were, who were basically going where I wanted to go. You know, I couldn't exactly verbalize it like that at that time, but you know, this is, this is not something that I learned in a book. You know, I learned it, I learned it from doing it. And I mean, there's, there's certainly information out there. I mean, nowadays with, with the internet being as it is and such, I mean, back when I, when I went through my journey, when I started my journey, you know, 17, 16 years ago or so, you know, I, I was learning everything on the fly. I was learning it the hard way and it, it, it took me a little bit of time, but I started to realize that, you know, if I, if I do what successful people are doing, then maybe I have a chance, you know, maybe I can be successful. And if I do what, what others are doing who are not so successful, maybe I'll get what they get, you know? So I hope that answers the question and I apologize that I, I don't have any, any books or any kind of information like that that I could directly point you to. Well, I think one takeaway from your response, Kevin, is that those of us in the field who are working with people coming out of incarceration or in the community seeking employment, uh, one of the best ways we can learn about how to support those individuals is to engage with people with lived experience and particularly uh, peer support specialists, reach out to them, engage with them, bring them into your program. Um, I, that interpersonal relationship is one way you can learn a lot about how to better support individuals who have been incarcerated and are now seeking employment. Yes, and I couldn't agree more, and I, I won't take too much time, but I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, you said the key thing, and that's, that's peer supporters. You know, my, my very first mentor was actually a guy who was just like me previously, who no longer was. I, I knew him. I knew him back when he was uh, into his addiction and when he was homeless. And when I, you know, when I met him again and he agreed to be my mentor, he wasn't. And that was the best thing that I, I mean, I could ever possibly have had at that particular time. I mean, with somebody who had actually been there, done that, and knew the way out. And Kevin, just one more question for you. Well, not one more, but uh, for now, um, one question that was directed to you is uh, someone who is working with people in similar circumstances that you were in, um, and uh, she said, for those of us working to support job seekers, how do we help them reach similar decisions to the ones that you reached um, during your process of transi transitioning back into the community? Do you have any words of advice for people working with those job seekers, how to encourage them to, to make some of the decisions that you made regarding your progress? Sure, absolutely. I, I could sum it up in one word, uh, partnership. I mean, there, there's a huge difference between directing someone to do something and partnering with them. And when I say partnering with them, that means you know, not only living, I mean, not, even, not only listening to what the job seeker has to say, but, but, you know, supporting them to the best you can, you know, in that, you know, I, I had, I had parole officers who would, who were telling me that I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then I had, I had one parole officer who said, you know what, Kevin, whatever works for you, that's what I'm for. And that, that ended up being the best parole officer I could possibly have at that particular time. And she supported me fully. She, she told me, she said, she said, I've never seen anybody in your situation go to law school before, but 
if it works out, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. And actually she did. She, she uh, facilitated a, a very fast transfer for me to be able to go to law school in Oklahoma while I was on Texas parole. So I, I would say partner with them, you know, listen to them and support them as best you can in whatever it is that they want to do. Well, thank you for that. All right, and I did have a question that came in. <clears throat> I believe this is specific to Ray. Um, so someone said, I'm currently developing a career resource center in our women's facility in Vermont. I'm interested in how you implemented your center because I keep getting blocked by our Department of Corrections due to security risks. Ray, do you have any advice for her or any recommendations as far as how she can overcome that barrier? Sure. I, I guess I would say in, in Wisconsin, we um, we had advocates at the highest level of our agency who um, wanted to see this be a reality. We wanted to provide more resources to people. Um, what I would say as far as security risk, um, do the benefits outweigh the risk? You know, and, and unanimously here in the state of Wisconsin, we said, yeah, you know, the benefits to this initiative outweigh the risk. There's always a risk in, in institutions. Um, there's a risk in using the phone system, in using mail. Um, we don't shut down the entire phone system because there might be a risk there. And the, and the same can be said for instituting this job center with Internet access. We worked with our uh, Bureau of Technology Management to um, eliminate as many risks as we, we think we can, while also recognizing that there's there is potential risk of security breaches um, with regard to the Internet. Um, and so it's just a lot of discussions, a lot of internal discussions with security-minded folks, with people who are more on sort of the reentry programming side to come to some compromises. And I just think it takes persistence. You know, we, we probably spent almost two years in discussions before we saw the first job center become a reality. And, it, and it's just the background work that needs to be done. Um, but I guess I would, you know, if you're in one of those meetings, I would just say, you know, let's just answer this one question. Does the benefit outweigh the risk here? And see what people say. Thank you for that, Kevin. I'm sorry, uh, Ray. <laughs> okay. So, um, and I do have a question specific to Sharina as well, and then we'll get into a few questions that I think are, are going to be appropriate for, for all of our presenters to answer. Um, so, Sharina, there was someone who asked, are there any tools you use to determine, quote, unquote, your brand? So is, is that just a facilitated conversation, or is there any tool or curriculum you use to, to help your participants with their branding? So we, have a, we do have a two-week employment readiness curriculum um, that was written by the former program director um, for LifeWorks program. Um, and there, there's one branding class. There's no specific tool. Um, we just use a lot of, like, um, thought-provoking ideas, if that makes any sense. Um, we kind of just come from that strength-based approach as to, you know, who is it that you want to be? Who is it that you want the world to see you as? How do you want the employers to see you? Um, and then we just talk about, we compare the clients um, rebranding themselves to what a company would have to do um, if they made a mistake. Um, and so that's how we get them to really think about, you know, we all make mistakes, but our mistake doesn't define us. Define us. Our, um, being just as involved doesn't define us. We can move past that, and here are some ways that we can do that. Thank you for that. Okay. All right, and this next question, I think um, I want to pose it to all the panelists. So if you feel like you, you would like to respond to this, please just chime in. Um, so this comes from someone who says that uh, she's an employment specialist in the Florida Department of Corrections. And mm -hmm. uh, she, she asked, you know, what is the best way to approach someone to help determine what their underlying condition is? So several of you talked about recognizing and addressing underlying conditions so that employment can be successful. So how, how should one go about 
helping determine or identifying what that underlying condition might be. Uh, Todd? Okay. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, well, just briefly, uh, for me, I, it, it, it just simply took me taking a deep, honest look at myself. You know, I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I look back through my relationship history. I look back through my employment history. I look back through my my uh, criminal justice involvement and, and its history. And I looked at all of those things and I and I, I took what the, the common denominators were with all of those and the common denominator pointed to me. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, you know, I thought that I thought that it was a it was just a bad system that I was in. I thought that there was a lot of racial motivation and, and things like that. While some of those might have been contributing factors, the main factor was when I took that that really hard look in the mirror, I realized, you know what, it's me. And if I'm the problem, then perhaps I can be the solution too. And, you know, taking that just a little bit further, you know, I looked at the common denominator and the common denominator was I had been I had been using and abusing substances since I was a teenager and I was, geez, I was 39, 40 years old. I was like, wow, maybe if I, address that first, maybe if I take that out, let's see what happens. And things did happen. So that's how I address the underlying condition. Yeah, and this is Ray. I, I would say from a staff perspective and, and so somebody that's working with somebody that um, has, has gone through incarceration, you know, I, I don't know about Florida, but I, you know, most states have some sort of validated risk and need assessment tool that will provide some, some pretty good information about what are maybe some of those underlying issues that brought someone to incarceration or towards criminal behavior. Um, absent that, I would say some, some just pretty open and honest discussions. I think one of the, one of the good ways to do it, and, and we don't have enough time to talk about what motivational interviewing is here, but motivational interviewing is really a way to Talk to someone about what you know. What is their intrinsic motivation? What motivates mm -hmm. them? And it's, and it's asking a lot of open-ended questions to get someone to begin to discuss. You know, what's important to them? What are their goals? And how do they maybe think they can go about achieving those goals long term? So I would do a little bit of research maybe on motivational interviewing, if um, if you don't have available the risk and needs assessment that can sort of hone in on what maybe some of those underlying needs are. Yes, I agree with Thank that. Thank you, Ray. Well. Mm -hmm. Sharina, do you have anything to add to that? So I was just going to say I agree with, well, I actually agree with both, with both Ray and Kevin said. Um, we don't use a standardized risk assessment tool at CCC. However, we do use a motivational interviewing style um, assessment with the client advisement. And then we also have a class um, that in the second week of our workshop where we, we really um, give the clients an opportunity to self-evaluate and, you know, kind of like what Kevin said, sometimes, you know, all of us, when we're dealing with something, it's easier to look outside of us and say, it's, it's this that's causing it or, you know, it's some other external factor. And we do provide the opportunity for them to take a, a good long look at what it is that they're doing. What part do I play in this process? Because as I said in my presentation, there are second chance employers. There are people who will give someone a chance, but you got to be able to show up and show out. And you can't really do that until you do your work. You know, and so you c the work can still be done without an assessment, although an assessment is helpful. Thank you for that. And we've also had a few questions about um, assessments regarding career readiness. Um, so do, do any of you, among the three presenters, do you, any of you have any thoughts or recommendations around, are there any tools that uh, our listeners should look at regarding looking at someone's employee readiness? I can, I can, okay. uh, this is Ray, I can say that that is definitely a need in this field. Um, there, there is not a consensus universal employment readiness tool that 
that everyone is using. Um, there are, you know, the, the barriers to employment success inventory, the BESI, that, that can be used. There's also something called the Online Work Readiness Assessment, O-W-R-A, um, that is, is in general, it's free. It can be tailored to your specific location if, you know, if you work with the provider to, to pull in some other elements. Um, otherwise, a lot of risk and needs assessments may have those pieces there. What we're doing in the state of Wisconsin, I'll just say, we're using the Compass Risk and Needs Assessment that has some of those employment readiness uh, components, but it doesn't paint the full picture. And so what we do, if, there, if there's some level of need indicated, we follow up with the individual with some of these other tools that I talked about, the BESI, or um, in the state of Wisconsin, we have something called Skill Explorer that the Department of Work, Workforce Development has created. It just helps get a little bit closer to the end result. So, yeah, for, I, unfortunately, that, that is a, um, an area of need in this field right now. Kevin or Sharina, anything else you would like to add regarding that? Uh, I could just say briefly, uh, uh, because both Sharina and Ray, you know, work on, on the other side of the table than, than I was, but I, I would just like to add that, you know, whatever tool you have or don't have, you know, it's, it's all about the, the attitude and the approach to it. I mean, everything, everything that we have at our disposal needs to be utilized. We need to use all the tools in our toolbox. And sometimes we, we may be deficient in some areas, depending on what, what state or jurisdiction you're living in. You know, some areas may not have certain tools and things like that. But again, I would just press everyone to, to use what you do have. Take a look at what you do have and make good use of what you do have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can honestly say that, again, we don't have a, a standardized assessment that we use. Uh, sometimes it's just very basic. Sometimes we know someone isn't ready to um, be employed because they don't even have an ID or a birth certificate. So sometimes our assessment is very basic and then over time, you know, it it could gradually grow into something um, more detailed. Maybe they have the skills. Maybe they have the the certificates to, you know, the qualifications to get a job, but they don't have an ID or a place to sleep every night to get up and and be prepared to go to work. So our assessment really is just trying to really do that one on one work to see what it is that we can assist with to make them um, more employment ready, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And uh, we've, we've had a number of people with lived experience talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and mm -hmm. how you have to address some of those basic things first before you can even get to some of the more complex issues going on. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And I do want to direct our participants to, you know, take a look at the chat and the Q&A. Uh, we do have folks sharing resources there. Someone said workforces, centers, has tools that are free. Um, someone else shared the employment skills workbook uh, that they use. And uh, also uh, IPS, Individual Placement and Support Specialist, they also have an individual assessment that, that they use. So um, that's a great those are some great suggestions. A number of questions have also come in around mentorship. And so that, that come up, uh, you know, in, in a number of presentations. And so the questions are around both, you know, how do we find mentors and, um, you know, are there any um, kind of curriculum or programs that we could, where we could find uh, mentorships and support those healthy mentorship relationships? But, you know, I don't know how much you, three presenters um, know about that aspect of reentry and supporting employment, but you know, what I'd love to hear, you know, what else can our, um, can our listeners learn about finding mentors, supporting mentors, and so forth? Um, I'll, I'll just start with Kevin. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, uh, and, and absolutely, uh, you know, at, at first, it, for someone that's unfamiliar or inexperienced with, with uh, working in this area, you know, it might seem like a challenging task, but it's not at all. 
it, it all begins with finding that one person, that one person or, or set of people, group of people who are having a measure of success. And you just simply ask them, would they mind coming back and speaking to others about what's working for them? You know, I, I started I started mentoring and and, uh, and sponsoring guys in, in recovery when I only had 90 days clean. I had 90 days clean and my, my sponsor mentor was saying, tell them what you did to get where you are. And that's what I did and it and it it's a self perpetuating process. You know, once you find uh, that one person or group of people who are successful, more times than not, they're gonna be more than willing to come back and to, to help others along the same way. That's how we pay it forward. You know, I could never absolutely repay my first mentor for everything that he gave me, but the way that I express my gratitude and I try to repay that is I help others. And how did you find your mentor, Kevin? Actually, it was uh, in rehab. The, the first rehab center where uh, my mentor asked me to go back and volunteer, I was actually a patient client in that rehab. And he had come in, he had come into there and I, I recognized him. And I was like, man, I know that guy. I know him from somewhere. And I went up to him after his presentation and I started asking him questions and come to find out he was somebody that I knew from years before when he used to get high and he used to, um, he used to be homeless. And so I met him there and, and basically what I did is just started doing what he asked me to do and, and passed along everything that he had given to me to others. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Ray or Sharina, from more of the programming perspective, any advice to others regarding how to find mentors, how to support mentors? Uh, we do the same thing. We actually um, have clients who are successful come back. Well, when we were live, we had clients who were successful come back and talk to the current class that we would be working with. Um, we also have community-based um, mentors as well. We bring them in by way of volunteering. We don't necessarily match um, clients up with their own personal mentor, but if we bring in a volunteer, we will allow that volunteer to mentor a whole group as opposed to just one client. Yeah, this is Rob. Just say briefly, you know, we we as a as a state Department of Corrections, we're looking more and more at how can we infuse some of that mentorship or peer supporters into our programming. Um, it, one of the best ways, and maybe you know, to Sharina's point, you know, a lot of community-based agencies um, have, have individuals who have um, lived experience or gone through the process or, or, or been successful, and a lot of those um, agencies are able to connect with folks in the community that um, that would be good options for people to be uh, mentors or peer supporters. But you know, as a state agency, we're, we're working towards more of a broader adoption of that kind of program model because, and I think somebody mentioned it in the chat, it, it, it can be a very important component to someone's um, eventual success in the community. Oh, and if I could add one thing, I just, it just jogged my memory um, when Ray was talking. We are a second chance employer. We hire former CCT clients who have completed our workshops and have gotten jobs at other places and, and want to come back and do the work. And so those are our number one mentors to the clients. They typically um, become client advisors or peer support specialists and they work one on one with the client. I don't know how I forgot that. <laughs> Thank you for that. And and that so we did have a question come up with from a participant and, and so that might answer his question about where where to find opportunities to to mentor others. So thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we are coming into the home stretch of this webinar, so I just wanted to maybe take a couple minutes to address another topic that's come up. And this is more broad, but um, you know we know that the, the reality, and, and I believe it was Sharina who really specifically mentioned that the, the trauma that many people in the criminal justice system have experienced or continue to experience. 
And so, you know, how do you, how do we even begin to approach that, um, the issues of trauma or, um, you know, the, the reality of um, having a mental health or substance use disorder? Um, so how do we approach those individuals to begin that conversation about the trauma that has, has happened to them? And so uh, we'll just start with Kevin and we'll just go down the three panelists. Uh, again, I don't mean to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but uh, fears. Fears, the, the easiest way to reach someone who is going through something is is by or through someone who has already been through that very same thing. You know, for me, my, my mental health, I, I went back and forth with my mental health, my substance abuse, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg. I, I just, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't get it until I got my first sponsor who had had similar circumstances. He had been through some of the same trauma and, and things like that. And uh, he, he spoke my language. You know, I had clinicians, uh, psychiatrists, like counselors, I mean, countless others. And the big difference was is, is while they were speaking a truth, they weren't speaking my truth. And, you know, that peer was able to connect with me on a personal level and I mean, nothing beats that 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 uh, personal empathy. You know, you know when somebody feels your pain. You know when they've been through what you've been through, and you listen to them. Thank you, Ray. Uh, Sharina, would you like to add comments around how to approach people, begin that conversation about trauma? You want to go first, Ray? Sure. I think. Um, it, it's, it's just part of our, um, it's part of the way we do business within the Department of Corrections is to acknowledge that nearly everyone probably has gone through some trauma. We don't know what somebody has gone through or is going through. So it's a sense of treating everybody as an individual, as a human being, as a person that has varied experiences in their lives and not assuming anything about anyone. Um, you know, and I don't want to sit here and, and act like everything's all roses and all staff are the best uh, at doing this, but we really, we really have a good training programs here in the state um, Department of Corrections to try to establish that sort of baseline interaction with um, people who are incarcerated or who are under supervision in the community. So part of it is just opening those sort of dialogue channels and being willing to listen and just being able to treat people as human beings as we all are. So I guess from from a, a, a an agency perspective, that's kind of how we approach it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Just to piggyback off of that, um, I was just writing down the word support. Um, we try to remain supportive. And yes, training, staff training is very important as well. Um, and to Kevin's point, yes, um, when someone has been through it, some clients only want to work with people who have been through it. But there's also people to raise point who um, are able to empathize with anyone, um, which is all you really need to be able to do. As I said in my presentation, we never ask anyone to disclose trauma or go back into it. However, um, because we are supportive the way that we are, oftentimes people will disclose those things to us, um, and then we will offer seeking safety. Um, to help with that, and if we need to refer out, we'll do that as well. Um, we never force anyone to go into seeking safety or, or again, talk about any trauma, just from a supportive standpoint solely. And and if I may just just round this up, uh, you know, as far as the trauma and and the other issues that precipitated, you know, the incarceration, for for professionals who work directly. With this population, I, I would I would say to to try to refrain from that that tough love standpoint and recognize that that the trauma, the substance abuse, the the mental health, all of these it, these are just symptoms of a sickness. Now it would be totally ridiculous for me to get mad at my grandmother because she has cancer and say I'm not ever coming to see you again because you're sick. But yet we tend to do that when we see the symptoms coming, the symptoms from these traumatic events and, and these, these, these deep, deep issues like that. There's a tendency to, to 
not see it as a symptom, but to see it as a behavioral uh, thing. Well, thank you, Kevin, for, for closing us on that note of really recognizing the, the humanity of people who are involved in the justice system and all of the things that may have impacted them and, and the symptoms that uh, we may see that, uh, you know, while we might not necessarily understand some of those underlying concerns or conditions that are affecting us. So um, we are at the end of the webinar, and uh, if some of you have lost sound, then, then I apologize for that. We, we have had a couple of glitches today um, due to the um, uh, hurricane and tropical storm going across the state. So if you are able to see the screen, we have an employment, um, we have a download available for you for the um, certificate of participation. And this is something that you can use for your own personal records and, and anything that personally you do to, to um, gain hours regarding education around these issues. And um, so what you do is just click under file name and the file name will highlight a different color gray and the download button will also change colors to a darker gray and then you click download, that will start the process to uh, downloading the certificate of attendance directly to your computer. And that is a secure process. So, um, so that is available for personal use. And we also have here uh, contact information. If you would like more information about these topics, then feel free to reach out to us here at the Gaines Center for Behavioral Health and Justice Transformation. There's our website as well as a direct phone line. Um, we would welcome any questions or contacts you would like to make. Uh, if you are on the Game Center's listserv, and I'm going to ask, can we can we go back to the Game Center listserv slide? Um, if you haven't signed up for the Game Center listserv, then I encourage you to do that. That will enable you to um, receive the slides. And we will send those out in a couple of days. So here on your screen, you should see this shortened link. Go directly, just type that link into your um, preferred browser, and uh, it will take you to a page where you can sign up for the Game Center of Rule Serve. And there we will be able to um, send you the slides when they're ready. We will also notify you when the recording of this webinar is posted to SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And that will take more than a few days. So you should receive the slides first, and then we will provide later notice when the recording is posted on SAMHSA's YouTube channel. And I also want to just extend my deepest thanks and gratitude to our three presenters, Kevin Ray and Sharina, for um, all of the wonderful insight and expertise they shared with us today. Um, it was truly enlightening and um, we really, really appreciate your time and participation in, in presenting this information today. And with that, we are bringing this webinar to a close. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at the Game Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. Thank you, Kevin. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.